see you. Have a good trip. Jake and Dee Dee Woolgar live on the shores of Great Slave Lake. Dee Dee, brought up in Europe, has been here 12 years. Bye bye. bye. And much of that time, she has accompanied her prospector husband on his trips and done the hunting for them both. Oh, I love hunting. I used to hunt at home as a young girl, and then really hunt in the bush. It's quite exciting. And I'd like to take the occasional trip to the bush with Jake, but there's very little time for that. Well, by plane, it's, it's fascinating. You just travel over thousands and thousands of lakes and beautiful bush country. If you fly low, you can watch it all. And rivers and lakes and the coloring is just beautiful. But to start with, we lived in a tent, but that's in the bush and in Yellowknife in a small one-room house. And there was no road and no electricity and no telephone. And then eventually a bridge was built and a road was bulldozed and then the electricity came in and the telephone and then finally the water system and we got built a new house. Do you still go out with Jake on his exploration trips, Mrs. Woolgar? No, I don't go away anymore. I find myself more socially involved here than I did in London or Egypt or Paris or New York. You seem to be constantly on the go. If it's not a bazaar, it's another party. Or it's uh, almost too active, I would say. I find very little time to do the things I would like to do. First, my daughter added to school or to work in the morning, and I have to get fairly early, and then I get back and have to do my book work or my correspondence and catch the mail at 11 o'clock and then do my shopping and uh, prepare lunch. And there would, there's always a social call of some kind that would disrupt your regular routine. And then I try to do a little bit of needlework or petty point or paint, especially in the barren lands. I mean, wherever you look, there's a different plant. And I think I could sit here for the next 50 years and paint. And I still find different flowers. And the growth is so fantastic. I mean, out of the snow, and here is the muskeg is just covered with flowers. And flowers, I don't think uh, people realize that even existed. Some are possibly on the, I would say. The Rock, a famous landmark in the Northwest Territories. Near here, the Woolgars live in Yellowknife, one of Canada's most northern settlements. Originally, it was a tent town, a jumping off place for prospectors and trappers. Most gave no thought to settling down, making a permanent home on these subarctic rocks. But through the boom years and the bad, some stayed on. And 10 years ago, on a sandy plateau two miles from the rock, they laid out an entirely new moment, a town of paved streets and cement sidewalks with a municipal water system, electricity, and telephones. A town built to last near the edge of the Arctic barrens. They took a chance when they built the new town. Would people stay here to bring up their children and live a normal life? Streets of tidy homes with lawns and gardens now give part of the answer. A huge new high school opening this year is badly needed today for the children of Yellowknife. A system of heating all domestic water to keep it flowing during the Arctic winter overcame many difficulties. In the summer or fall, on a casual stroll through the streets, 
It looks much like any other town of 3,000 people anywhere in Canada. But it is definitely northern and proud of it. Some of this pride is in the name of the local women's association, the Daughters of Heights Sun, Mrs. Rose Curry, president. Mrs. Curry, I suppose the main problem has been keeping the houses heated through the winter. Well, we've never found it any problem. Of course, some of them, it depends, I suppose, on uh, how they are built. If they're insulated, which some of them at first weren't, well, it is a problem then. It was more of a problem when you had to use wood. Because you, were, you had to fire during the night instead of uh, this way. We turn the stove to whatever temperature you want it, and then just go ahead and uh, go to bed. That way, why well, you had to uh, get up and put wood in. Yellowknife, when you're away, how do you feel about the place? Well, it's just uh, you go outside and you do your visiting and what things you have to do, and there isn't an awful lot left, as far as I'm concerned, to do out there. I'd rather get home and relax and enjoy it. Everybody's going crazy outside, running from one stoplight to the other. And in here, why, you can walk over down and take your time about it. They say we're bushed, but when you stand on the corner and watch the people out there, I think they're bushed. How about the fly problem? Well, uh, I imagine to somebody coming in from outside, it's terrible. And yet you get a little bit kind of used to it. It doesn't bother quite so much. Uh, you hear them outside saying, oh, the mosquitoes are bad. And you're looking around to see where the mosquitoes are. This in here, why, they get uh, horrible. You can go out picking berries, and you don't say, uh, they're in your eyes, and you breathe them in your nose, and if you go to say anything, you've got them in your mouth, too. <laughs> Twenty-one years ago, there were no buildings in Yellowknife. People lived the year-round in tents, and everyone was a prospector. There was a boom in mining and depression in the provinces, and the bush pilots had finally established the aircraft as dependable transport. In 1938, there was more air freight carried north from Edmonton than was lifted in the whole of the United States. Larger freight had to come in by tractor trains in the winter. They had to contend with extreme cold and blizzards and the cracking and humping of the ice on the lake. Many men came from the Peace River country in boats built by themselves. They were followed by the first of the stern wheelers. The first claims gradually became mines. The greenhorns and tenderfeet, the farmers, accountants, and clerks became prospectors and miners and grew to like the free and easy life of the North. Today, you still have to make part of the trip into Yellowknife by air, but by a regular airline and to a modern airport. And down at the old waterfront under the rock, the Fokers, Fairchilds, and Moths have been replaced by beavers and otters. Modern planes and in greater numbers than before, because Yellowknife has remained the flying center for an expanding northern district. At the docks on the other side of the rock, barge freight arrives from Fort McMurray after an 18-mile portage down the Athabasca and a dangerous tow across the open lake.
Sometimes the barges piggyback truckloads from Hay River on the other side of the lake. The end of the highway from Grimshaw, Alberta, almost 600 miles to the south. Oil, however, comes in from the north, from Norman Wells on the Mackenzie. The manager of the transportation company, George Ingalls, tells us of some of the problems of running a northern supply operation. There are several uh, which are quite important and which, over which we have no control. You have good equipment and you might have a, a dry season outside or a, 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 a winter with very little snowfall and the water in the Athabasca River gets very low and uh, it's a shallow river anyway and you get a multitude of, uh, of sandbars which uh, the boats and the barges and uh, then uh, you have to uh, possibly just put on half a load instead of a full one which makes the the uh, uh, the time of freight arriving at destination much longer than otherwise it would be if uh, if uh, there was deep water then when you get down to this end, uh, say the lower end, uh, the, uh, the uh, system is cut in two by that portage at, uh, at, uh, between Fitzgerald and, uh, and Fort Smith. And you come to this end and there is uh, lots of water from Fort Smith all the way down to, to a Klavik and the Arctic Ocean. But uh, we run into a very heavy uh, storms in the fall of the year starting as a matter of fact, st starting just about now, and uh, the boats are not able to travel on the lakes, and sometimes they'll be held up for as much as seven days waiting at the mouth of the river to cross the lake. Uh, it's a good job uh, that uh, uh, there is 24-hour daylight here in the summertime, otherwise I don't think we would be able to do it. The uh, season on an average into Yellowknife is, is I would say, the 12th to the 15th of June, when the first barge comes in, and the last one goes out the 15th. That gives you uh, about three and a half months, not much more. And uh, when the barges come in, uh, we, we take no cognizance of, uh, of uh, eight to five or anything like that. We just unload them. And uh, sometimes it's midnight, it's two o'clock in the morning, and uh, Saturday afternoons and Sundays, they just don't mean anything to us. Uh, uh, there's just so many days, and all days are alike when it comes to unloading the cargo. In the old town on Yellowknife Rock, the past is still alive, and life continues much as it was when the first wives arrived in the town. Many of the old timers prefer to stay here, closer to the easygoing frontier life they'd come north to find in the first place. Here are still the trappers and prospectors, and the talk is still of exploration and gold strikes and new finds in the wilderness. Long ago, the old town grew down off the rock and out over the flats until a decision had to be reached. Where was it going from here? Town councillor Ted Williams was involved in that decision. Well, originally the old town of Yellowknife was built where it is at present because the bush plains in the early days, that is 1938, docked in what they call Back Bay, which uh, gave them shelter, and the cargo boats uh, docked in the same area, and the old town business buildings and uh, a few residences and tents and shacks were erected there simply, they, they just simply grew like weeds, because that is where all the business was transacted at that time. And the old town was quite adequate before the war. After the war, when the second boom started, 
it was found that the old town became inadequate to handle the business, and there was not the the terrain there is not very good for residential purposes, and the when the old town was surveyed, they had to try and fit the surveys to the buildings already erected, and it was decided by the government to plan and build a new town, which is the present town site of Yellowknife. There was some controversy at that time as to whether the new town was warranted. Well, there were naturally the two opposite reasons. One was that the uh, people living in the old town, particularly a lot of the old timers, they, I think that a lot of them uh, wished to keep it more uh, northern uh, settlement. And uh, the idea of building a new town here uh, seemed to a few of them as an encroachment on the, the old northern uh, setup. The other one naturally was that a great number of people said this is only a gold mining camp. The mines will be mined out and uh, we'll have a new town and it'll simply become a ghost town. And the, the, the situation just doesn't warrant expensive building and a layout uh, such as we have here at present. One man who believed in the growth of Yellowknife from the start was Martin Bodie. Danish by birth, he came here 20 years ago with the single intention of starting a market garden. 10 days to find this draw between the rocks, and he's been gardening commercially here ever since. The fact that he was the first to try this didn't bother him. His only concern was would there be a market for his produce? And there was. Could we have a look at one of those big ones? Could you cut one off there? Yes, yes, sir. I guess that. How much would it weigh, do you think? Oh, about six pounds. It'd be worth in town. Uh. The store will pay me about 90 cents for this one. What would they sell it for? They will sell it for about a dollar and a quarter. How many would you grow in a year? I expect to have uh, uh, over 10,000 pounds this year. 10,000 pounds? That would be maybe 1,500 cabbages. No, that's 3,000 cabbages. So I'm probably putting it pretty low. What else will you grow besides cabbage? Oh, I raise uh, cauliflowers, onions, green onions, lettuce, radishes, and carrots. Do they all do as well as this? Yes, they do, yes. I uh, cut a head a day that weighs over three pounds. The season is short, but the summer days are long. Martin Bodie is one of the few who came north because of the climate, because he liked gardening and he liked water. But for most, the mines are the center of existence, the only reason for the town. The big ones are consolidated mining and smelting, and the giant yellow knife. Together, they produce annually about eight and a half million dollars worth of gold and employ about 600 men, earning well a million dollars in wages. Murray Pickard, manager of the Giant, tells us some of the changes he's seen in the town since he first came. Uh, in those days, it was quite common for a woman who had a bathtub and running water to invite uh, the wives of the less for fortunate men uh, over to a bathtub party at least once a week so that they could uh, clean up. Uh, I think conditions have uh, improved markedly along this line. When you first came, did you think you were going to be here for any time? At okay. that time, uh, I, was, uh, I wasn't considering staying too long. <laughs> How do you feel about that now? Oh, it's, uh, it, well, eight years have now passed, and I'm still here. I think in all probability, I'll be here for quite a few more years. 
Oh, did you find that as your stay seemed more and more permanent, uh, that there was a greater effort on everybody's part to bring in the amenities? Oh, this is definitely true. Uh, uh, the number of orders for deep freezes and uh, dishwashing machines and this sort of thing that uh, go in is increasing all the time. Uh, it's, it's the rare person who today hasn't a fridge and a washing machine. And dishwashing machines are even becoming quite common. Where do the workers come from? Uh, up, I would say approximately half of our, of our labor force uh, is uh, made up of uh, people who have come to Canada in the past uh, 10 years. And uh, what would the leading nationalities be? Well, many nationalities are represented. Uh, probably the, uh, uh, most certainly underground, the uh, uh, Germans would be the largest individual group. What do you think brings them up here to work for you, or, or uh, work for any of the other mines, for that matter? I suppose uh, partly the spirit of adventure. They uh, feel that this is a uh, more or less one of the last outposts of empire. They're uh, referring to the Northwest Territories, that is. And uh, also the uh, very uh, definite hope that uh, they're going to make some money. What would an average underground worker make up here? I would think that the average underground worker would make about 5,000 a year, between four and 5,000. Uh, they do this through their uh, direct wages and then uh, they work on a bonus system. Few Europeans coming north would think to bring their soccer boots, but five teams play in a hard fought league on this clay pitch. Many learn baseball here for the first time, and in the winter, hockey and curling. Many come expecting isolation and fall easy to Yellowknifer's full acceptance of air travel. There are two full-time travel agents in town, and the people are used to going anywhere on the continent for their holidays. Many came for only a couple of years' work. Others have always been here. Native Canadian or immigrant, in one sense they are all new citizens. They are members of a town which has only been incorporated for four years. The mayor this year is Ted Horton. Uh, I, however, the only the fourth mayor that Yellowknife has ever had, even though we celebrated our 21st birthday this summer in 1958. Because before we had a mayor, the town was governed by an administrative council, a good many members of whom were appointed. And it was only within the last six years that we obtained the privilege and the responsibility of having a fully elected town council in Yellowknife. But this is only a, an example of the advances that have been made in this town and in the north generally in the last few years. Oh, there are a good many things that remain to be done, including more sidewalks to service our people, extension of our waterworks, and there's quite a history behind that waterworks, too. That is that uh, the waterworks themselves are a donation to the town from the senior government. The, they are estimated, well, they did cost two and a half million dollars and were given to the town as, as uh, just free. They, we have had no problems in connection with expenses, as you can see with our water well, just this year, when for the first time in Yellowknife's history, we have to extend the waterworks to new areas which are being developed for residences, and also to the new federal school and so on. There's very little danger of us running out of water. We have all Great Slave Lake to draw on, and that is one of the largest lakes in the world. I believe it's about sixth largest lake in the world. Fluoridation is, uh, is coming to pass. The people of Yellowknife at the last municipal election in November approved of it overwhelmingly. We are having studies made. The equipment is set up. We're almost ready to fluoridate the water, set up for it, and we're just waiting the approval of a senior government engineer. I think this town is going to develop eventually into a city with a population of 10 to 15,000 people. 
It, uh, it is completely surrounded by mineralized areas. It has become established as a sort of a distribution and transportation center. It has an airport capable of taking all the latest in jets and, and large transportation aircraft. And it is on the border, as I said, of one of the largest lakes in the world. As Canada expands north, many new towns are expected to appear. The physical problems of building and servicing can be met, but the question most often asked is, what will the life be like? Can families live and grow in the North? Or must it just be a place in which to mark time until one can make a stake and return to the outside? Yellowknife gives us something of the answer. This is not a one-company town built to predetermined plan. It is a town which gradually grew of itself, built by people who came north purely and simply to make a stake, and then decided that they could live here. They decided that with a little ingenuity, anything that could be done in the provinces could be done in the territories. And they discovered also that the northern landscape of rock and sky and water held more color and excitement and satisfaction than the possible. In northern frontier towns of the future, many other Canadians will make this same discovery for themselves.